on my webcam for just a second so you can see how I look. Um, good morning from Montana. I really appreciate that so many of you have uh, participated from all over the world and I realize it's not morning for everyone. So thank you very much for being here. And I want to say thank you to Ilke for uh, facilitating this session and to Kathleen Shearer for um, uh, the invitation to present to core members. So let's get right into it. Um, whoops. I just want to outline the presentation agenda. We will, of course, uh, first talk about search engine optimization, a rather high level view. Um, I'll show you some evidence of, of what my research uh, partner and I have achieved over the years. And then we'll talk very specifically about uh, institutional repositories and Google Scholar and the specific requirements of Google Scholar. <clears throat> well, I'll talk about the deficiencies that we have noted in um, uh, institutions and their repositories which fall into two broad categories, technical and organizational deficiencies. <clears throat> and then we'll go into analytics and reporting. Um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about Google Search Console and its importance, Google Analytics. And then I wanna introduce you to a web service that we have recently launched um, through a grant funded project and with some partners which we believe is a very accurate uh, way of counting file downloads from institutional repositories. <clears throat> As I said, this will be a fairly high level um, overview of search engine optimization, but if you want some more, that there, there are lots of resources out there for SEO on the web and in books. Um, the reason for keeping it at fairly high level is that the, uh, the, the, the technical details of how to do this change slightly uh, over time, but the principles that I'm going to talk about have remained uh, pretty steady since Patrick O'Brien and I started doing this research. So we published a book in 2013 that was uh, published through the American Library Association, and then we also published with the Council on Library and Information Resources in 2015, a cookbook, uh, more of a step-by-step -step, uh, video set of video tutorials on how to do search engine optimization. Um, that cookbook is really easy to find, just Google getting found SEO cookbook and uh, you'll be directed right to it. So if you want more specific detail on how to do this, um, these two resources, um, of course, I would recommend because I was a co-author on them. Um, so let's start right away with our high-level overview of search engine optimization. Uh, two reasons, the two main reasons I feel for needing to do SEO is that if your repository has not been optimized for search engines, they will always suffer from low visitation and use. The amount of traffic that comes through search engines and that is referred by search engines is mind-boggling. Um, and we, if, you're, if you have not paid attention to SEO, then you, you're never going to get uh, very much traffic from those search engines. And the second uh, very legitimate reason is that if your repository is optimized for search engines, then it will also be accessible to disabled users. You have to think about search engines and their crawlers as disabled users, visually disabled users. So if you optimize for search engines, um, the, same, the software that disabled users use to navigate through websites will also be able to use your sites. So two very good reasons. <clears throat> so where this all began for me, um, for over 10 years, I led the digital library team at the University of Utah. and by about 2009, we had digitized more than a million newspaper pages and more than half a million objects of all kinds of other formats. Um, we had some significant regional project, projects running like the Mountain West Digital Library, the Utah Digital Newspapers, and some local projects uh, like the uh, University of Utah Institutional Repository, which was called USpace. And about that time, we started to get some inkling that maybe um, these collections were not being used as much as we thought they were and were not appearing in search engines as much as we thought they were. 
<clears throat> so we started to ask the hard questions. And it turns out that we, the hunch was right. They were not really uh, being used and were not really being found by search engines. So in 2010, the cold hard truth that we had to face and that we figured out was that only 12% of the, our digital collections had been indexed by Google and less than 1%, about half a percent of the use space uh, institutional repository had been indexed by Google Scholar. So it was a pretty dire uh, situation we realized and we were, uh, as you might imagine, quite shocked. Um, but we started to poke around and realized that we weren't the only ones. Uh, all of the, the, the um, spot checks that we did for other institutions revealed similar problems. And about this time, I met this guy, uh, Patrick O'Brien. Patrick is actually an economist by training. He holds a master's degree in economics from the University of Chicago. But he had a lot of experience uh, and expertise with search engines, and he really took an interest in our problem and started to dig into it. And it's been uh, a long and fruitful partnership uh, ever since. <clears throat> so by applying some basic search engine optimization techniques, we were able to improve the indexing ratio in Google. So starting in 2010, we knew that we were about 12% indexed by Google. So an indexing ratio is the number of URLs that are actually indexed by Google versus the URLs that you have made available to them or submitted to them through sitemaps. And we were at about 12%. By April of 2011, we had raised uh, that to 51%, and then it just kept going up. Uh, November of 2011, we were at 79%, and then finally in December of 2013, we hit uh, 92%. All of this in getting, getting our digital objects better indexed in Google resulted in more referrals and more visitors. So from all Google properties, we were able to show in this 12-week comparison of 2012 versus 2010 that we uh, experienced a 500% increase in the number of referrals that Google was uh, giving us. And that resulted in about 136% increase in the number of visitors who actually landed on our, um, on our repositories. More visitors, of course, means more um, uh, number of page views per day. So you can see there again, the numbers went up significantly starting in about April of 2010. But a funny thing happened along the way. Even though we were doing fabulously with our cultural heritage collections, and even though we were also raising at the same time the indexing ratio of USpace, the, the University of Utah's institutional repository, in Google, all the way up to about 98% indexing ratio of USpace materials in Google, we were making zero progress with Google Scholar. We were still ha had a 0% a indexing ratio, and that, of course, led to a lot more um, research, <clears throat> figuring out why this was such a problem. So this leads to our special SEO problems, institutional repositories and Google Scholar. So the audience for any institutional repository, of course, is the people first, uh, scholars, researchers, and even the lay public who uh, benefit from us making uh, scholarly uh, publications and other scholarly output available in perpetuity and um, as open access to anyone around the world. But I would argue that a, a, an audience that's almost as important um, are, is search engines, <clears throat> because search engines drive the people uh, to the repository. And specifically, I would argue that the most important search engine for an institutional repository is Google Scholar. <clears throat> It's important to understand that users are not your users until the search engine refers them to you. And the search engine is not going to refer them to you if 
it is not confident of a good user experience for its users. Okay, and we'll talk about um, uh, the, the user experience more in the deficiency themes. So what's so special about Google Scholar? <clears throat> well, it may be the most highly used general academic search engine. Uh, Google Scholar is not very good about putting out numbers or, or tooting its own horn, uh, so it's, it's hard to figure that out. But there has been research over the years that shows that although Google Scholar was, was widely criticized in the early and mid-2000s, it has uh, grown tremendously uh, in coverage and in accuracy. Um, and it, it is now, I would say, one of the high, most highly used um, search engines for academic materials. The really important thing about it is that it delivers a high value audience. You know that people who are being referred from Google Scholar are researchers who are seeking scholarly publications, and that's what you want want for those are the people that you want to visit an IR so it's a much higher value audience than people who are coming from Google uh, from Yahoo from Facebook from Twitter and so forth <clears throat> uh, it's important to recognize that Google Scholar is actually a sub organization of Google uh, and they have a different index and a different method of harvesting and indexing materials if our research shows that if an IR has been properly optimized for Google Scholar's requirements, then somewhere between 48 and 66 percent of IR traffic actually comes from Google Scholar. So that's a, a huge reason to make sure that your, your IR is working well with Google Scholar. So What's the other thing that's special about about Google Scholar is that it has uh, special metadata requirements. Google Scholar says on its uh, Webmaster Inclusion Guidelines website, use Dublin Core tags as a last resort. They work poorly for journal papers because Dublin Core doesn't have unambiguous fields for journal title, volume, issue, and page numbers. And that's crucial. Uh, a search engine like Google Scholar needs to have each of those um, data pieces broken into a separate field so that uh, the machine can the machines can can uh, work and and repurpose those fields. So instead of Dublin Core, uh, what Google Scholar wants is one of these four uh, schemas: High Wire Press, ePrints. BPress, which is what uh, Digital Commons uses, BPress tags, and PRISM, which is a publishing um, schema. So one of those four uh, should work just fine. And we've had great success uh, using Highwire Press. So just a quick note, side note, about how search engine crawlers actually work. They don't actually crawl through databases. Uh, instead, they, they function much as humans do, where they follow links, they'll trigger the generation of uh, a page, an HTML page, and then they'll index the text that appears that's displayed on the HTML page, as well as text that's displayed in the head section of the HTML. And this is really where the metadata schema has to appear. The, the descriptive tags for each article have to appear in Highwire Press or one of those other schemas in the head section of every HTML page for every publication. Now, of course, this is not done manually. This is a scripted process, so it's, it's done very in a very automated manner. But that's what has to happen, basically. Google Scholar also has the ability to harvest and index uh, text from PDF files, but the metadata has to be in the HTML head section. <clears throat> so what does that look like? Here's a, a human readable citation for an article. Works just fine for us, right? But uh, it's very difficult for a machine to parse the different sections of, of this citation. Here's what the same citation looks like in Highwire Press uh, as Google wants them. So you can see that every uh, field there has a particular uh, 
tag, citation title, citation author, so forth. Uh, and this is all metadata that appears in the HTML head section of the web page. Once Google Scholar has that kind of structured metadata, it can do um, all kinds of things with it, including spinning out citations in various styles. So let's talk a little bit about the deficiency themes that we saw um, in our research. <clears throat> we'll start with organizational deficiency themes. Um, SEO tends to be uh, very informalized in most institutions. When I give this, this kind of presentation live, I always ask for a show of hands on whose institutions have a formal SEO problem, uh, SEO uh, program. And it's almost nobody. Um, so SEO needs to be driven from the top of the organization and not just left to IT. Um, communication is another deficiency. Uh, administrators often don't communicate the reasons for an SEO program and its impact to the rest of the organization. And the part that's underlined there is, is quite interesting. Communication among the staff involved in SEO programs can also be poor. Uh, and I'll talk a, a little more in detail of one manifestation of that in just a couple of slides. And then analytics reporting is often ineffective. Um, when institutions have installed um, analytics software like uh, Google Analytics or Web Trends, they often don't install, implement it um, in a very um, holistic kind of manner. They tend to implement it uh, in siloed ways for each repository or each website or each collection. And that makes it very difficult to track users across collections and it makes it difficult to uh, report uh, on all of the collections. So some of the technical deficiency themes that we found. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the poor search experience uh, for search engine customers. And this would include things like slow servers and slow network speeds, um, failing to use a secure transfer protocol, which has all of a sudden become very important. Um, and then incorrect use of redirects. Uh, for instance, you have to know when to use a temporary direct versus a redirect versus a permanent redirect or a uh, page not found versus a page not accessible to you kind of message. <clears throat> um, so, so this is uh, the, 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 this touches on the communication issue between staff that I was talking about a moment ago. You have to make sure that when you submit sitemaps to Google, which uh, invites crawlers to come in and index the collection, that those sitemaps maps don't conflict with the robots.txt file that sits on the server. At the University of Utah, we had a programmer and a server administrator sitting about 20 feet apart from each other in cubicles. And the programmer had submitted uh, a whole lot of sitemap uh, files uh, to Google, inviting the crawlers in. And the server administrator had set up the robots.txt file to disallow um, uh, crawlers from coming into those collections. And the two staff members never talked to each other. Uh, and so, of course, Google wasn't going to index uh, those collections. <clears throat> Google Scholar um, uh, recommends not posting files, PDF files exceeding five megabytes. This is also on their Webmaster Inclusion uh, Guidelines website. Sometimes it's difficult to um, limit to that file size, but um, this can also hinder indexing. So more deficiency themes. Uh, website design. We all like pretty websites, um, but excessive use of graphics can be barriers to search engine crawlers. Um, confusing site hierarchies and paths. If it takes too many clicks to get to the PDF, um, Google Scholar, for instance, says there should be a maximum of 10 clicks from the start of your website to getting to the actual file. Um, and then very often, uh, one of the things that we don't realize that isn't quite obvious is that many content management systems or digital asset management systems don't use canonical links. In other words, they provide 
numerous paths, numerous links to get to the same digital object. And this too is confusing to search engine crawlers. And then metadata, as we talked about. Um, not knowing what Google Scholar wants is a, uh, a technical deficiency that we've found to be quite widespread. It's, it's gotten better, of course, over the, over the years. Um, but again, those are the, the four schemas that Google Scholar really recommends. Another problem with metadata is when you provide metadata that uh, is not unique. If you use a similar uh, title, for instance, for uh, multiple objects, and this is more uh, clearly more of a problem with cultural heritage materials where you can have 50 photographs that are very similar and the, the metadata cataloger gets uh, runs out of ideas on how to describe and just starts using the same title, man on horse, for instance, for every um, photograph uh, to a search engine crawler that looks like it's all the same stuff. Um, and so they won't index it after a while. And then inaccurate and inconsistent metadata is a big problem. Uh, and this is often introduced to, uh, during rekeying. And this is a big problem with institutional repositories. We, do, we still do an awful lot of manual keying for our metadata. So just a word about the secure hypertext transfer protocol. I mentioned this a couple of slides ago. Um, this has uh, recently become a, a very serious uh, uh, signal in Google's algorithm. Uh, Google announced, I think back in 2014, that they would begin penalizing sites that do not use HTTPS, and they have now started to actually do that. So your, your collection, your repository, your website will uh, fall in, page, in the PageRank algorithm uh, if it is not using the secure uh, protocol. So what HTTPS does is it encrypts data that's transferred between the server and the user. And this is also a significant um, privacy feature. And our research has, in a, that we're going to publish in a forthcoming um, uh, article, has found that of 279 research libraries that we looked at from the Association of Research Libraries, the Digital Library Federation, and the OCLC Research Library Partnership, we found that only 62% had implemented a secure digital certificate for their websites. Only 20% of those used the SEO best practice of redirecting non-secure requests to secure fulfillment, and 15% actually did something uh, worse. They turned secure requests into non-secure uh, fulfillment. So again, this is something that um, is an SEO signal that Google will penalize for if it's not done correctly. So in summary, um, be a good provider to uh, search engines. Provide uh, responsive networks, responsive applications, responsive servers. Um, make sure there are, are no dead ends, uh, that you're using appropriate redirects if you have to move files from one place to another. Use that uh, HTTPS. Submit sitemaps to invite crawlers in, but make sure that they don't that the robots.txt files doesn't conflict with sitemaps. And then pay attention to metadata, that you're using the, the right schema, um, that you're placing the metadata in the HTML head um, tags and that you're using uh, unique descriptions for your files. So these are just very high level um, uh, items that, that absolutely need to be um, addressed. <clears throat> okay, let's move into analytics and reporting. <clears throat> there are two great uh, tools, free tools that Google provides uh, that should be used in tandem. Many of us, I think something like 90% of the research libraries that we've surveyed, uh, again from that pool of 279, use Google Analytics. Uh, so most of us are pretty familiar with Google Analytics. Um, many fewer are familiar with Google Search Console. Google Search Console is a very powerful tool that diagnoses problems that search engine crawlers encounter and provides other valuable SEO diagnostic uh, information. 
Google Analytics, of course, measures from the user side. It measures user visits. Um, it's important to set this up as an umbrella so that it covers all of your sites and repositories so you can track users as they move from one to another. And the important thing to know about Google Analytics is that it is great at, at counting HTML pages. It is really not great at all for counting non-HTML files. And this becomes really crucial for institutional repositories. And it is the reason that we developed RAMP, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. Finally, if you implement these tools, make sure that you record a baseline uh, with these analytic tools before you start doing any SEO. Um, it's, it can be hard, as it was for us in 2010 at Utah, to, um, to recognize how deficient we were, uh, but you won't ever be able to measure progress if you don't first establish a baseline. So just quickly, this is what Google Search Console looks like. Uh, over on the left side, you can see those, uh, those menu items with the carrots next to them. Those are all expanding menus, so there's a lot more information there. Uh, and then what I've got up in the center is the, just a, the default dashboard for Montana State University's institutional repository called ScholarWorks. Over on the left side, under current status, uh, this tells you very quickly that everything is OK. Uh, the crawlers are not experiencing any significant errors. It does list about 2,000 files there, that, or, or 2,000 URLs, not necessarily files, that it has been unable to find. So that's something we need to check on. Over on the right side, it shows you our, Google, our um, indexing ratio. Um, so here we can see that we submitted 12,600 URLs and Google has indexed 10,400 of them. Um, so that's about an 82, 84% indexing ratio. That's pretty good, uh, could be a little bit, bit better. You'll never get to 100%. One really the crucial thing to note about Google Search Console is that it is for Google. It is not for Google Scholar. Google Scholar still doesn't have diagnostic tools like this, um, but this is at least this at least tells you how Google's crawlers are faring when they come to visit your repository. Um, another important part about this is that the middle section there, search analytics, actually gives you some information about what people have searched for. So here you can see their actual search phrases, um, um, what they were looking for in, in your repository. So there's, a, there's an, uh, a lot of information in Google Search Console that's very valuable to use. And that brings us to RAMP. Uh, the Repository Analytics and Metrics Portal. This is a web service that um, Montana State University developed with its partners, OCLC Research, the Association for Research Libraries, and the University of New Mexico in a grant-funded project with funding from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And this is uh, a web service that we believe accurately measures uh, the file downloads from IRs. So the basic problems with uh, IR uh, with, with analytics tools is uh, this. There, there, there are two classes. One is the page tagging services like Google Analytics or Web Trends, or there are others. They rely on a JavaScript that's embedded in the HTML page of every page on a website which makes them really good at counting HTML pages, um, but really lousy at counting file downloads from IRs. Um, and it's used, Google Analytics we know is used by at least 85%, if not 90% of the research libraries that we, that we uh, looked at. <clears throat> the other class of analytics tool, tools is log file analytics. And this captures file downloads very well, but it also captures everything else. And when I say everything else, I'm talking about robot traffic, of which there is an enormous amount uh, on the internet. Now, 
search engine crawlers are robots, right? But they're the good robots. They're the robots that we want to come in and, and harvest and index our repositories. But there are uh, lots and lots of other um, robots out there whose intent is not so good. And more importantly, we don't want to count them as human traffic. So previous studies have shown that up to 85% of IR downloads uh, is non-human generated. In other words, up to 85% of IR downloads are uh, performed by robots. So filtering out those robots uh, is very difficult, <clears throat> particularly for um, libraries, which really don't have the resources to, to, to do this. You know, the problem with robots is that they constantly change. They're constantly evolving, and so it's difficult to keep up with, with them. So for reporting purposes for an institutional repository, we have proposed a new reporting model. Um, rather than just saying um, uh, Google Analytics is showing us, you know, that we're getting X number of visits to our IR, we think that the, the type of uh, pages and files that are being viewed should be um, a little more granular, should be broken up a little bit. So in, an, in a, an IR, ancillary pages are those HTML pages that provide general information or navigation. So these can be search results, browsing pages, statistics, and so forth. Item summary pages are also HTML pages. Um, and the, this is what the user sees just before deciding to click on that download the full publication uh, link. So both of these, ancillary and item summary pages, Google Analytics is very good at counting, okay? But the real gold of an institutional repository is the citable content download, or what we call the citable content download. And these are the non-HTML files um, usually publications, uh, often presentations, data sets, other kinds of files. Um, these are the files that you want to make sure that people are downloading and reading because this is what they should be citing uh, as they uh, move through their research process. You hope that they're not just citing the item summary page where the abstract uh, lives. <laughs> so just quickly, this is an ancillary page. This is our scholarly, scholar works. Um, uh, splash page. So this is HTML. This is a set of search results in ScholarWorks. We would also consider this an ancillary page. Uh, this is an item summary page. This is where the uh, preprint link uh, exists that users can click on. Um, and this is still an HTML page. So although page tagging services like Google Analytics do not track non-HTML pages. We, have, we um, know that Google Search Console does, and that has formed the basis of our web service ramp. So this depend, ramp depends on Google's ability to filter out robot traffic. And we think that Google is probably the best in the world at doing this simply because their revenue stream depends on it. Google has long had uh, this advertising model called pay-per-click and 90% of their revenue in 2015, which was $75 billion, came from that pay-per-click advertising model. And the way it works is that advertisers pay Google uh, average of uh, five cents to fifty dollars per user click, um, per user per click every time a user clicks on their advertisement, and so advertisers want to be certain that these clicks are humans and not robots, and that's why Google needs to be able to prove this over and over again, and those clicks, those pay per clicks, can go. Uh, can go higher than $50. They can go about uh, up to about $900 per click. So this is a very high stakes game. <clears throat> so we looked at, as part of our research, we looked at a data set from four repositories um, in the spring of 2016, 134 days. Three of these were DSpace uh, repository platforms. One was ContentDM. Um, and we looked at the difference between what 
uh, Google Analytics could count, which are these, the item summary page views and the ancillary page views, versus what we were able, the additional um, downloads that we were able to track with RAM, um, the citable content downloads. Now you'll notice that there is another column in there called download events. And this is a feature in Google Analytics that can be turned on to capture file downloads. However, there are two problems with this. One, you'll notice that two of the repositories that we looked at didn't have download events turned on in Google Analytics, so they weren't using it at all. The other problem with it is that it only counts download clicks from that item summary page. So if a user has been browsing around in your repository, gets to an item summary page, clicks on that preprint or publication link, that, and download events is turned on in Google Analytics, then it will be counted. But they are completely missing all of the external uh, referrals to um, files. So when, when you see that PDF link in Google Scholar, for instance, uh, in, a, in a search result and you click directly on it, it completely bypasses HTML pages and goes directly to the file and that is completely missed by Google Analytics. So we're able to capture a lot more data. And how much more data? Well, you can see the total um, item summary and ancillary pages and citable content downloads that Google Analytics was able to, uh, to count in the two left-hand columns. And then the additional 563,000 citable content downloads that we were able to capture with RAMP um, in that 134-day period for those four repositories. And that's a 2,000% uh, tracking improvement of citable content downloads. And of course, you want to be able to report this information. So this is what our RAMP landing page looks like. We have about 20 institutional repositories signed up with us so far. We're tracking um, over 400,000 digital items um, and capturing an average of 20,000 citable content downloads every day that were previously invisible. Um, and we currently support uh, four IR application stacks, so DSpace, Fedora, Hydra, mm, I can't remember what the fourth one is. But ultimately, we, we think we'll be able to support all of them. And we don't charge anything for this, um, for this service. So if you are interested in um, signing up with us, uh, please let me know. It provides a lot of valuable information. Um, and we would be happy to add you to RAMP. These are some recent publications, um, undercounted file downloads from IR, um, and then a specific article about RAMP. And at the bottom is the URL for the proposal that drove this uh, RAMP web service, the proposal that IMLS funded. So um, in conclusion, Search engine optimization definitely works to drive more traffic to institutional repositories. It works particularly well when you have paid attention and optimized uh, your repository for Google Scholar. Um, it's important to diagnose, measure, and report website visits with proper analytics tools, and that means using Google Search Console and Google, Ana Google Analytics in tandem. And then finally, uh, to really get at the gold, the IR file downloads, um, uh, RAMP, we think, is a, a great option. So I'm happy to entertain any questions. And thank you very much for your attention this morning.